Shri Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Sinamane Namaste Sharashwati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sasanivari Pacharasa Satari Hare Krishna Jeradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Unjabi Hari Kupi Janavalava Giri Bharadhari Kupi Janavalava Giri Bharadhari Chishodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Chishodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Manachari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jashodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Jashodhanandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Panachari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Mom Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamani Namaste Sarashwati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sasanjavadi Paschatras Lotran Das Thakur wrote a song about Vrindavan. Vrindavana Ramayastayan Tivyad Chintamanidam. You know that song? Any of you heard that song? Vrindavan Ramayastayan Tivyad Chintamanidam. Never heard that? So, uh, it was a song, and Prabhupada asked one of his disciples, Vishnu John, to come up with a melody. So he came up with that melody. Kind of a mystical melody. And um, it describes Vrindavan. And the last verse of the song says that if we remember Krishna's pastimes, even in this miserable material world, we can be happy. So I was thinking when I was singing that song, we all have so many problems. Do you have any problems, any of you? Yes, Prabhu, I have 108 problems every second. Yeah. So, um, and he says that in the material world, when you remember Krishna Lila, you actually leave the material world. So then you, there's no problems there. So then when you merge in remembrance of those realities, that's the reality. Not This reality is not real. Those are the realities. Then you don't have any problems. That's nice, right? What do you think? So when we chant Jai Radha Madhava, I always think, okay, the plane is taking off or the spaceship is taking off, we're going to Vrindavan. So forget everything else and go to Vrindavan. And Krishna's having a lot of fun there. More fun than we're having down here, that's for sure. Isn't it? He's having all kinds of fun up there, playing jokes on the gopis. You know, young boys like to joke with young girls. You know that? Gopinath, you know that? <laughs> That's how you know if a guy likes you, because he plays jokes on you. He does, he does mean things to you. That's how you know he likes you. These boys are, you know, they're a little weird. Some of them are really weird. Anyway, um, Krishna plays jokes on the gopis. He, because he loves them, he likes to create awkward situations for them. So they have a lot of fun. The gopis plays joke plays the gopis play jokes on him, they all laugh, and then he goes back, um, after he goes to Radha Kun, he goes back with his coward boys. He spends five hours at Radha Kun, but the coward boy, for the coward boys, it's 10 minutes. He comes back in 10 minutes, but it was five hours for the gopis. You can spend the rest of your life figuring that out, how five hours becomes 10 minutes. Or you could think about how one night became a day of Brahma, yeah. But anyway, um, so he goes back to Coward Boys and they have fun and they're playing and 
you know, joking and yeah, it's great. If I were you, I'd want to go there. What do you think? Sound like a good plan? Better than what we have going on here? No, the only problem is we have so many unfulfilled desires. But I haven't fulfilled this desire. I haven't fulfilled that desire. And I always wanted this and I always wanted that. And then you come back and take another birth and you can't join Krishna. That's unfortunate. Isn't it? It is. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But anyway, at least we understand, we at least we understand our misfortune. Then we can deal with it. Okay. So today we're going to continue reading from this amazing document on what is called spiritual bypassing. I find it, I find it extremely interesting. Okay, we just have to figure out where we left off. Hmm, oh no, okay. I want to read the last sentence. And then he takes this idea of spiritual bypassing and then he brings it into how it affects a community. One might, for example, try to practice non-attachment by dismissing one's needs for love. But this only drives the need underground so that it often becomes unconsciously acted out in covert and possibly harmful ways instead. So uh, this is quite interesting. And so we, we have been talking about how it's kind of, there, there's, there's, there's various ways you can deal with things which appear to be antagonistic to bhakti. You can just kind of send them away and pretend they don't exist. You can push them down inside and pretend they're not going to bother you because you they they're buried so deep they they won't affect you. Or you can pretend, and I think a lot of us do this, at least when we were younger devotees, that they don't exist at all. Which is, you know, I think that's that is uh, living in a dream world. But for some people, the solution to a problem is just to tell yourself the problem doesn't exist. That way, if the problem doesn't exist, you don't have to deal with it. That's okay if you actually transcend the problem. But even if you transcend it, you wouldn't say it doesn't exist, right? You would just, it's just not affecting you. That's the idea. So, I was, um, I think, I think in my spiritual life, uh, one, of, one of the things, you know, sometimes it happens that you don't know how to deal with a problem. And so there's nothing you can do, but just like pack it up in a box and, you know, put it in storage, basically, because you don't know how to deal with it. And maybe you'll figure, I'll, I'll learn how to deal with it later, or I'll never ha learn how to deal with it. Or um, So it, whatever the case is, if you don't deal with a problem, the problem will deal with you. Have you noticed that? I'm not going to deal with the problem. Well, no, it's good. <laughs> it'll deal with you. Um, <laughs> yeah. The uh, it's kind of like an addiction. You can avoid it, but the addiction will deal with you. So. The, the, I think one of the themes of this paper is that it's quite common amongst spiritual people to think that through the process of their spiritual practice, they wouldn't have to deal with any problems because the process would take care of all the problems. And that's true. It's, it's true, but it's relatively true because... Some of the problems are pretty deep, and it's not going to resolve the problems right away. And sometimes we need help dealing with problems. So what I have found through the school of hard knocks is that the best thing you can do 
if there is a problem, is to acknowledge it, allow yourself to face it, and deal with it. I mean, that's the quickest way to solve it. And any kind of resistance to the problem, just as we know, what you resist persists, the problem doesn't go away. It might go away from your conscious. You don't, let's say you don't consciously feel it or experience it, but it's there. And then what he's saying here is it comes out sometimes. Have you ever, you ever noticed you're acting in a strange way and you, you don't know why, because there's really no reason to act that way. And you feel, if maybe you, you really upset because you got ignored by somebody, which is, you know, not the worst thing in the world to be ignored. But, you know, one day you were really upset um, or somebody was just trying to correct you and you became really upset. That's the point he's making, that it comes out, you know, you've suppressed, let's say, a certain need you have and denied it. And now it's coming out because it's not being fulfilled by somebody else and you're getting really upset because you haven't dealt with it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so he's just saying that don't, basically he's saying don't use the spiritual process as a, as a shelter to avoid what you need to face. Um, I think I think also this this perhaps manifested most strongly in grihastha life, because the idea in grihastha life is if you're Krishna conscious, I'm you know if the husband's Krishna conscious, and the wife's Krishna conscious, then we'll have a good marriage. Well. It depends what you mean by Krishna conscious. Now, if you mean Krishna conscious, uh, which includes respect, empathy, compassion, affection, um, sensitivity, yeah. But in those days, when we read that, Krishna consciousness meant you get up at four o'clock, take a cold shower, jump up and down at Mangalarti, chant your rounds like a madman, and go to Bhagavatam class and try to stay awake. Um, that in, a, in and of itself doesn't guarantee you're going to be a good wife or a good husband. Uh, and then um, I'm dealing with a, a couple now. And um, the husband's very strict, and the wife is not as strict as the husband. And he's very upset with her that she's not so strict. And he's, he's, his feeling is Krishna consciousness is the solution. So he doesn't want to become human enough to fulfill the needs of his wife and family. And so it's not working, even though he's very Christian conscious. So what we find is, and this sounds weird, and we have to qualify it, that sometimes the Krishna consciousness is what ruins the marriage. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Gopinath, when you get married, make sure you're not too Krishna conscious, because if you are, you can ruin the marriage. Gopinath's like, that, no problem for me, I can do that. <laughs> Comes naturally. <laughs> So what, what's being talked about in this article um, is that you, you, you can disconnect from your human side. And so rather than being more compassionate, respectful, sympathetic, humble, it becomes the opposite in the name of that's Krishna conscious. I can share. You want the whole article? Well, I'll have to... Uh, how should I share the article? You want it in the chat? I don't, I just have it on my computer. I don't have a link for it. Anyway, we'll figure that out later. We'll send it to Tanya. She knows what to do. If I send it, if I put it in the chat, then you can copy it and create a link or something. Tanya, you can do that? Maybe. Should I put it in the chat? That's a lot. I don't think the chat will hold a full article, actually. It doesn't, right? No, it's too much. Okay. So, um, so what we've seen is that um, sometimes in the name of Krishna consciousness, one, one actually becomes less Krishna conscious in some areas. So they become um, more hard, fanatical, harsh, less compassionate, less loving, less empathetic. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Have you seen that before with others or with yourself? It's very strange. 
And no, I'm staunch, I'm strict, you know? You're not, you're a fool, you're a rascal. You're a nonsense. Yeah, was, of course, Prabhupada did these things, but generally it was for non-devotees. Um, so there's, there's a potential problem that as a spiritual practitioner, you feel like your human side is your weak side or lower side, so you deny it, you turn it off, you, you put it on ice so it doesn't affect you. And then, and then um, but it often blocks your ability to manifest those qualities in a relationship because you feel like, well, if I'm too compassionate, I'd be compromising my principles which doesn't make sense, but it can be thought that way. Like this story, this is the classic story of this devotee. I've told you this story before. This devotee, he wanted to take sannyas. He was about 24, maybe 24, 25 max. So he'd been married a few years and he had a son who was a year old. And he was finding household life was challenging. If you get married, you will find the same to be true. So, um, but things are challenging because you don't know how to do it, right? Just like if you're learning an instrument, you go, oh, this is so hard. And I go, give it to me, I'll show you. And, and, and then I show you, I go, oh, that's easy. That's how you play it. And I go, yeah, it's easy. So you, you ever have that experience? Something's hard until someone shows you it's not hard. So grass to life can be difficult until someone shows you, oh, it's difficult because you're doing it wrong. But in any case, um, when in the early days when we got married, it was, it was like this idea that if you're just Krishna conscious, you'll have a good marriage meant if you have good sadhana, you'll have a good marriage, right? That is part of it, but it's not all of it. So, and I think, I think that idea is, it's, it's, it's like, well, you just have good sadhana, so many good things will come. It's true, but not everything. You have to do more because your sadhana is only for maybe two hours, three hours, four hours. What about the other 20 hours? What do you do then? Oh, I don't worry about it, Prabhu. I have good sadhana. You just have good sadhana, everything. What about the other 20 hours? Everything. So it's not exactly like that. The, your sadhana, yeah, okay, you just have good sadhana, but your sadhana actually continues all day. So if you add the other 20 hours as your sadhana, yes, then it makes sense. So, okay, so now I'm very strict devotee. And I don't want to compromise my principles. And I think that being too affectionate to wife and family Material attachment, red flags, you know, my, my brain's red flags. It's material attachment, it's right there in fifth canto. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna die thinking of your wife, you know, like what could be worse than that? I can, can you think of anything worse than dying thinking of your wife? I mean, what could be worse than that? <laughs> so you tell your wife, Gopinath, you better be a pure devotee because when I die, I'm going to be thinking of you and I want to be thinking of a pure devotee because otherwise it's going to be a big mess. The thing we didn't know is that Prabhupada was talking about, he was talking about materialistic householders, not devotees. So, you know, it's kind of like we were afraid that if you're compassionate, affectionate, all this, it's just maya. Okay, so let's look at the results of that. How many devotees who were married in 1970s are still married? Well, some of them are still married. They're just not still married to that same person. So the question is, how many are married to the person they were married to in 1970? I think I asked you this question last week, didn't I? Did I ask the question last week? And it's very few. Very, I... I I, I don't know all, but I can only think of like five or six that were married then that are still married. So if I were doing my dissertation on this, I would start seeing there are some reasons, you know, what are the reasons? And this is one of the reasons that 
in the name of detachment, we detached <laughs> from the qualities of a devotee. <laughs> that was weird, right? No, I can't be too compassionate to my wife because then I'll be materially attached. I can't be too kind because I'm the man and I wear the pants in the family or the trousers if you're from England. I wear the trousers. She has to do what I say. If, if, if I do what she says, that means I'm weak. No, it actually means you're strong because you're humble. If she only does what you say and you don't do what she says, it means you're, a, you're weak. But we, we thought it the other way. So it, it was a total misunderstanding. And uh, yeah. OK. So don't make the same mistake, ladies and gentlemen. You know, like sometimes the devotees get married and say, is it OK to be affectionate to your husband? Is it OK to be affectionate to your wife? And the, kind of the answer is, uh, why did you get married if you don't want to show affection to somebody? Like, if you don't want to show affection, you don't need to just show it to your god brothers, your god sisters. You don't have to be married. Right? You get married because you want to show affection. Why do you have kids? Because you like staying up all night? No. You have kids because you want to show affection, right? You have that need to show affection, to give your love, to have, right? Isn't it? That's what uh, what's it? Jefferson Airplane said. Don't you want somebody to love? You know that song? Does that ever make it into your generation? Don't you want somebody to love? Don't you need somebody to love? That was, yeah. It's not like, <laughs> she wasn't saying, they weren't saying, don't you want somebody to love you? She was saying, don't you want somebody to love? Don't you need somebody to love? You better find somebody to love. Isn't that interesting? Even they understood. So, um, yeah. Is it okay to be attached to your wife? Is it okay to be attached to your husband? Well, how could you have a marriage if you weren't? How would that work? Well, we have a two-story house. I live on the top floor. She lives on the bottom floor. And once in a while, we see one another. It's a really good marriage, but we never get in any kinds of fights because we never see one another. Oh, I travel. I travel all the time. We never get in fights because we're never together. These are the kinds of, you know, um, you know, for those kinds of people, they don't need to be married. That's a mistake. To be married is a mistake. Okay, let's read on. So the last thing we read is about pushing, in the name of detachment, we push, um, we push needs down and we ignore them. So then he says, this dynamic or um, this dynamic may account for some of the challenges in our spiritual communities. The notion that our thoughts and feelings should be ignored because they are simply a product of Maya or the material energy. That's the idea. This notion can be helpful when we are trying to focus on devotional practices like hearing chanting deity worship. However, when it comes to managing our day-to-day -day life situations, this is written by Ram Baru Prabhu. These uh, same ideas can be used to suppress and deny feelings or concerns that need our attention. That's nice. Feelings or concerns that need our attention. So if you deal with it, you can solve it. If you don't deal with it, it's going to come and haunt you like a ghost. And then it comes out in relationships and creates problems in relationships. And we all want good relationships. And, um, you know, if you want to be a hermit, that's another thing. And this is not appropriate, but that's not really the process. Sangha is the process. Spiritual bypassing shows up most often as problems in our relationships. Yeah, so I've said this before. You know, if you're, if you're alone and you're, you are, you know, detaching, and as a result, suppressing all kinds of feelings. It, it can be problematic, but you may not notice it so much. But when you go into relationships, that's when everything is like, <sighs> everything gets stirred up. Because if, if you have any kind of 
well, just let's let's just use the word weirdness. We all have some weirdness, right? So if there's anything weird about you, it'll become more evident when you go into a, a close relationship. And uh, your partner say, why do you always, whenever I say this, why do you always like leave the room? <laughs> do I do that? Yeah, you do. I said, I don't know. And you think about it. it says, my mother used to say that. It drove me crazy. You know, something like that. So, you know, you wouldn't normally realize this in just living in a Brahma Trinity ashram or something. Because nobody's going to tell you that. Hey, Annapurna, why are you so weird? No, but your husband will say that. Why do you always do that? That's so weird. Nobody is going to tell you that. And you didn't even know you did it until somebody said it. And you'll say the same thing to him. Or you just did something and he's upset. And why is he upset? You know, then you realize, oh, what I did, that wasn't, that wasn't wrong. And then so you start to, to look at yourself and say, okay, what's going on with me that I act this way or I say these things? So um, it's also true when you're not married, if you're working in close relationships with other devotees, you know, steadily and closely, these things will come up. And when we're working on teams, the um, this kind of self-awareness is really important because teams need to work well together. If you know, for doing anything that's upsetting the team, upsetting someone else, it's really good if we're aware of it and we can correct it. And that will that will make the team more unified, energized, and so forth. And um, you know, if we ever make a mistake, if we can acknowledge it, apologize, this is what empowers teams. Have you ever been in a situation where someone makes a mistake and they just blame everybody else? Yes, Prabhu, that happens about four times a day to me, yeah. So that doesn't make good for teams. That creates a huge problem for teams. Um, so, you know, if you're just Krishna conscious, everything will work out. Okay. We accept that, but we have to define what just Krishna consciousness means. It means more than 16 rounds, four principles, going to Mangalarti, whatever. It means a lot more than that. It means 24-7 exhibiting the qualities of a Vaishnava. Respect, humility, compassion, forgiveness, integrity, and so forth. So, and then if we do that, then in relationships, things go well. Hmm. Okay. Spiritual bypassings shows up most often as problems in relationships. If we were a yogi meditating in a cave, our psychological wounding might not show up because our focus would be on our spiritual practices. It's in relationships that are unresolved, psychological issues tend to show up most intensely. That's because psychological wounds are always relational. They form in and through our relationships with early caretakers. That's interesting, right? If you have psychological wounds, it's because of a relationship. <laughs> and then it comes up in relationships. Yeah, we're all pretty messed up, that's for sure. I mean, Prabhupada knew how messed up we are. You know what Prabhupada's solution was? Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> You're so, all of you, your Kali Yuga residents, you're so messed up. Um, still, we're trying to be better. You know, we're trying, you know, we're trying not to hide behind the Maha Mantra. And, and, you know, but we all have, we all have issues. And it's okay. It's just normal. You know, I don't think, I don't think issues are a problem. I think the problem is not working on them. Or, or number, first problem is not recognizing them. Because that shows a lack of humility. And then, of course, if you don't recognize them, you can't work on them. But if you recognize them, that's good. Then the next problem would be not working on them. So problems are not a problem. Problems that aren't dealt with are a problem. We all have problems, believe me. Even successful people have problems. Even advanced devotees have problems. So hold on a second. Oh, Govinda. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. If you don't have any problems, there must be something wrong with you. That's all I can say. Hare Krishna. Okay. The basic human wound, which is prevalent in the modern world, forms around not feeling loved or intrinsically lovable. Wow. Did you hear that? Wait a second. I'll read that again. The basic wound, which is prevalent in the modern world, forms around not feeling loved or intrinsically lovable as we are. Wow. Inadequate love or attunement is shocking and traumatic for a child's developing and highly sensitive nervous system. And as we internalize how we were parented, our capacity to value ourselves, which is also the basis for valuing others, becomes damaged, if you were raised that way. Well, we'd call this a relational wound or the wound in the heart. So we, we have uh, talked about this a lot. And, you know, um, Krishna loves us. That, that's like... That's the best person to be loved by, for sure. And um, I told you the other day, Prabhupada said, I think I told you, Prabhupada said, when we preach, we should tell people that Krishna loves you. That should be our message. Because there's, you know, people don't feel loved uh, enough. So, and so we've talked about Krishna loving us, and we've talked about self-care, loving ourselves. And you know, we're all imperfect, and our parents aren't perfect, and uh, we may have not felt valued enough. Some, not all of us, but some of us may not have felt valued enough, and it was never our fault, because a child should be valued, certainly, right? Isn't it? Yeah, children are to be valued, cherished, loved, and so forth. So if we were raised and we, we didn't feel cherished, loved, it's not because we weren't lovable, it's because it was coming from our parents. Maybe they were too busy, maybe they did love us, we just didn't see it, you know, it could be so many things. Maybe they didn't know how to love, but that's, that's was their fault, not ours. So we have to understand these things. But still, what he's saying is that a child's not going to understand those things, so it does, it does have an effect. And as you become an adult, you have to recognize that. So, um, I told this story. It's such a funny story, but it, it makes this point. I've told this story before. Maybe you forgot. Um, we have this god brother. He went to Germany. And he would get a letter from Prabhupada every week. And he needed those letters to keep him going. So, he'd get the letter. He would get the letter like Sunday. And he would be good for six days, but on the seventh day, he would crash. And he would just sleep all day. And then the, the, oh no, the sixth day, he would crash. And then the seventh day, which is the, the week is over. No, seven days in a week, the eighth day. The seventh day, he would go to sleep all day. The eighth day, he'd get the letter, and he'd, he'd be good for six days. And then the seventh day, he would sleep. You know? He needed that encouragement that somebody's behind you was confidence in you. Somebody's there. You can do this. You can do this. Go for it. You know, I mean, that's so, it's so valuable to have that, right? But sometimes we don't have it. And sometimes we have people behind us telling us you're just the opposite, something wrong with you. You're doing the wrong thing. You're a bad person. Now, what can be worse than that? So um, sometimes Prabhupada would correct us for three seconds, 10 seconds, 12 seconds. Um, and then he would put the, he'd make the wound of correction, then he'd put the salve on it, you know, make some joke or like, yeah, but it's, so I have a story for you. So um, Malati once in San Francisco in the early days, was walking down the street and there was a truck that was delivering butter. And so the man went in the store to deliver butter. And while he was in, she took the, she took like 32 pounds of butter out of the truck for the temple. Because, of course, everything belongs to Krishna, so 
You should just take anything for Krishna, right? Saves a lot of money that way. So it just so happened Prabhupada was looking out the window and he saw her steal it. So he called her up to his office and he said, so you stole the butter? And she's saying, well, Prabhupada, everything belongs to Krishna. He said, yes, everything belongs to Krishna, but Krishna has given everyone their quota. You shouldn't steal. So, you know, I don't know how he said it, but probably he had to say it with some force. So obviously, you know, if you do something wrong and your spiritual master tells you, you know, it's not a good feeling. But then, but Prabhupada, his mood was always to smooth it out. So the next thing Prabhupada said, he said, well, you shouldn't steal, but when it comes to butter, Krishna was a butter thief, so it's okay. So of course, she got the message that you shouldn't steal. I don't think she thought you're gonna, it's okay to steal butter, nothing else. So Prabhupada was like that. He was the ultimate encourager. He had to correct us, but he'd never correct without encouraging, or he'd never correct somebody who couldn't take the correction. So we need that encouragement. And, and we need to be around people who encourage us. That's very, very important, especially if we have a tendency to doubt ourselves, we need to be around encouraging people, for sure. We can't, if you doubt yourself and you're around people that doubt you, that's like a disaster. Or if you feel bad about yourself and you're around people who make you feel bad about yourself, you, you're never gonna get out of that situation. So Prabhupada was always encouraging because we needed that. Because, you know, we're becoming devotees. It's difficult. It's easy to become discouraged. You know, you look in the mirror and you go, oh, my God. You know, I was thinking of that verse. You know the verse in the, there's a chapter in Gita, um, Divine and Demoniac Nature. So Krishna's listing all the demoniac qualities, you know. Could, you know, basically, you know, the qualities of your average politician. You know, conceit, harshness, pride, arrogance, you know. Just like, if you don't have those qualities, you'll never get voted in, right? You know, so he's listing... He's listing all those qualities. And then he says to Arjuna, don't worry, Arjuna, you're born with divine qualities. And then my thought is, well, then I, can, I need to worry because I wasn't. <laughs> like, how, how am I going to take that verse? And I go, oh, my God. <laughs> he was born with divine qualities. Don't worry. Well, I'm worried now because I wasn't born with divine qualities. So, you know, Prabhupada understands that. He understands our battle. We weren't born with divine qualities. Of course, we all were born with some good qualities but not on the level of Arjuna. So he was always encouraging us. No, it's very nice. Go on. You know, don't be discouraged like that. So we need that in our life. We need that, for, we need that from the people around us. We shouldn't be in relationships with people who would discourage us. Like red flag ladies if you, and gentlemen, if you're looking for a partner and they're always criticizing you, um, it's time to walk the other direction. Actually run and never come back because that will destroy you. To live with someone who's always putting you down will destroy you, right? So Prabhupada would correct and then he would pick up because he knew, okay, we corrected. Did you understand? Okay, so now everything's fine. You've understood. So now you're fine. Okay. And then we've told those stories in which Prabhupada did not tell people to do things that he knew they couldn't do because they would be disobeying him, they would be discouraged, they would feel like a failure, so he just wouldn't do it. So he was the ultimate encourager. So, so um, I was once talking to one of my godbrothers, he's a spiritual master, and he said, he asked me the question, he said, what do you think, what, what do you see as your essential duty as a spiritual master? And I said, to encourage disciples. And he said, yes, I, I also feel that, because that's what Prabhupada did. And Prabhupada encouraged everyone, even if they fell on their face. All right, get up. Keep going. So we need to remember that. That's important. That Prabhupada's affection, no matter what we've done, Prabhupada said, I'm your ever well-wisher. Even if you leave me, I'll always be your ever well-wisher. So Prabhupada's always our ever well-wisher. We need to understand that. Krishna loves us, even though you might think there's no reason to love us. But he's our father. Um, he wants us back, so we need to understand that. And then we need to learn how to love ourselves. Because if we berate ourselves, then we're committing violence to ourselves. Do you ever have a bad thought, a thought that would 
be harmful for you? Of course you have. That thought is a violent thought for you. It's, it's violent in the sense that it's, it's going to impede your bhakti. So if anything that impedes your bhakti is violence. That's the definition of violence, impeding your spiritual progress. So if you have a thought that impedes your spiritual pro pro progress, that thought is a violent thought. It's self-violence. So if we're engaged in self-violence, that's unhealthy, and how will we progress? So we, we engage in self-care. So Anapurna, if you have a new bhakti, and, and your temple president says, I want you to take care of this new bhakti, I'm sure if she makes a mistake, you'll just say, that's okay, don't worry about it, and just encourage her, right? You're not going to say, you are such an idiot. You know, the first day she moves in the ashram, you are such an idiot. How, how could you do that? What, you might as well just leave. You would never say that, right? No, you would say, that's okay, you know, let me show you how to do it. Very patient, encouraging, loving, right? Isn't, I think, we would all do that, wouldn't we? I hope we would, right? Okay. Have you ever told yourself you're an idiot? You might as well just leave Krishna consciousness. Maybe. Something like that, yeah. So what we would never tell anybody else, we would tell ourselves. There's something wrong with that, isn't it? Think about that. What I would never tell another person, I sometimes tell myself, right? So that means I love others more than I love myself? No. It, it, we have to love ourselves at least as much as we would, or care for ourselves at least as, at least as much as we would care for others. Right? That's, that's essential. So there, um, so if, if we feel, you know, the, the need to be loved, the need to be appreciated, the need to feel valued, it's, it's ingrained within our psyche. And so you might say, yes, but a devotee shouldn't have those needs. A devotee should be transcendental. Okay, the word is should. Where are you at? What you should have and where you're at, you have to distinguish because you have to deal with where you're at, not what you should have, right? I can't get out of bed. Well, you're only 30. You should be healthy. Yeah, well, that doesn't help. I know I should be, but I have no energy. Well, just get up and run around the house because you're only 30 and you should be healthy. And so you get up and you're like dragging. And, I should be healthy. I'm 30. It doesn't work. You have to deal with the fact that actually I'm sick. I need to take care of myself. I have to care of my, care, take care of myself like I'm an old woman right now because I'm sick. So that's important, right? Isn't it? Yes or yes? Yeah, okay. Okay, we'll get to your questions in 15 minutes. So, um, So this is important. What I should and what I am may not be the same. And so if I deal with myself as, a, as I should be, it often creates problems. If I deal with myself as I am and then work to become what I should, accepting what I am, then it works, right? Then the should becomes your goal. Instead of the should shaming you, it becomes an inspiration. Yeah, I should be a pure devotee. That's, that's a great goal. Um, but right now I'm not, so I, I deal with it as I, as I am. I deal, with, I deal with what I'm dealing with. Okay, Annapurna, we're going to start a business. Here's $1,000. And Annapurna says, but we need at least 5000 to do the business. Well, figure it out. You've got 1000 now, now she has to, like, figure it out. Right? So that's all you have. So that's all you can work with. You, know, like, you should be a pure devotee. Yeah, but look at me. I'm a mess. Okay, well, that's what you're working with. Work with a mess. Work with whatever you have, whatever good you have. You know, put the bad aside, work with the good, and um, you'll be okay. So, I would, I would encourage all of you to treat yourself and work with yourself as you would treat and work with another person. Who you're trying to help because that's very important for your Krishna consciousness to stay encouraged. Utsahan, 
nishtaya dharya tat tat karma pravartana. The first, first qualification is enthusiasm. So we are, we have the potential to destroy our own enthusiasm. And perhaps more than anybody else, because nobody can really destroy your enthusiasm. You have to let them, right? I say, Alina, you're a fool. And Alina says, I'm not a fool. I'm smart. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Or Alina says, yeah, I am a fool. I'm such a fool. I'm the foolish. I'm the most foolish of the fools. Why even get out of bed? You know. So you allow yourself by your response. So if someone calls you a fool, then you could think, well, I mean, using me as a bad example, because your spiritual master is supposed to call you a fool. That's good for you. But, but an ordinary person. So someone calls you a fool, and then you could think, yeah, maybe I've done, maybe what I did was foolish, but I'm not a fool. I can do better. So you respond to that, right? Because, because if you have self-love, you'll say, okay, let me look at what they said and see if I can improve. But I'm not going to take that and allow that to degrade me or I'm not going to allow what they say to harm me because you care about yourself. You protect yourself. Does that make sense, Alina? You, have, you, you, you protect yourself, right? So that's where self-love comes in. So, so if you have self-love, nobody can hurt you because you, you won't allow it. Even if what they're saying is hurtful, you won't allow them to hurt you. Have you ever been in a situation where someone is really disturbed or, or you've been really disturbed by some, what someone said? And so now you're allowing this to really upset you. And if you, if you were dealing with another person, what would you say? Say, don't, don't worry about it, that's just him, you know. He's, he says that to everybody, you know, just, you're fine, you're good, I don't see it that way. That's what you would say, right? More or less. So why wouldn't you say that to yourself? Interesting question, isn't it? So, um, yeah. You know, when Prabhupada is saying we should we should go out and preach and tell everybody God loves you. Yeah, I think we should tell ourselves first. Like, you know, maybe 108 times a day when you wake up, Krishna loves you. And don't, and don't say, Krishna loves you. And then the next thing you think is, but why would he love me? I'm such a jerk. No, Krishna loves you. Um, you may understand, you may not understand, but it's a fact. You can't, you can't change that fact by anything, by any, you just can't change it. It's just, it's the way it is. Okay. So let's keep reading. There is a whole body of research in Western psychology showing how close bonding and loving attunement, there's a whole body of attunement, showing how close bonding and loving attunement, which is known as secure attachment, have powerful impacts on every aspect of human development. Secure attachment has a tremendous effect on many dimensions of our health, well being, and capacity to function effectively in the world. How our brains form, how well our in endocrine and immune systems function, how we handle emotions, how subject we are to depression, how our nervous system functions and handles stress. So, um, you know, love is the, like the best cure, isn't it? Love is the cure. Be with people who love you. Those who don't love you, don't hang with them. It's going to harm you. Of course, um, sometimes it's not possible because <laughs> your mother-in-law doesn't love you. Uh, anyway, but wherever you have control, uh, be with people who encourage you. In contrast to the indigenous cultures of traditional Asia, modern child rearing leaves most people suffering from symptoms of insecure attachment. 
And these are the symptoms, self-hatred, disembodiment, lack of grounding, chronic insecurity and anxiety, overactive minds, lack of basic trust, and a deep sense of inner deficiency. So most of us suffer from an extreme degree of alienation and disconnection that was unknown in earlier times. From society, community, family, older generations, nature, religion, tradition, our body, our feelings, our humanity. Well, yeah, to one degree or another, not everybody, not everybody's childhood was traumatic, some more so than others. Uh, maybe it was, and we don't even, sometimes we don't know. So, yeah, so he's just making the point that um, modern society is, is different than traditional society. It's different than traditional society. So, uh, so how we're raised can present problems for us. Most of us turn to Krishna Dharma, at least in part, as a way of trying to overcome the pain of our psychological and relational wounding. Yet we are often in denial or unconscious about the nature or extent of this wounding. We only know that something isn't right and we want to be free from suffering. We may turn towards the Krishna Dharma from a wounded place that we're not even aware of, seeking to feel better, but unintentionally using our spiritual practice as a substitute for facing our psychological issues. So we had spoken about that. We come to Krishna consciousness uh, as a solution to our suffering, and then we don't face the issues. We use Krishna consciousness solely as the sole tool. Being a good spiritual practitioner can be used to cover up and defend ourselves from our feelings of not being good enough resulting in our spiritual practices being used to defend against or denying our real life human issues, which prevents us from being a healthy, balanced human being. So it's any of you who want to go back to school and do a PhD or a master's degree, um, or maybe Tanya, you can go back to school and do this one. Um, it would be how how spiritual practice and philosophy can have negative psychological impact if it's misunderstood. And there are probably um, examples in all religious traditions, because basically that's what we're discussing. It's, it's not that it's, it will have negative impact, it's just when it's misunderstood, it can have negative impact. And so it would be such an interesting, I think it would be such a useful research to do because, um, or you don't have to do a, a master's degree to do it, but if, if any of you would be so inclined to do some study and write a paper, it would be good to give that to new devotees and say, when you join a spiritual movement, these are possible things that could be going on for you in your effort to advance spiritually. You may deny some of your, your human needs and develop some. Huh. But, uh, run away from some problems. I, I really think we need something like that. I think that would be so helpful. Actually, I, I was writing a biography. The purpose of the biography was to highlight all these things. As I, as I um, confronted them in my life, many of times um, misapplying, misunderstanding. But the idea of the biography was, if, even if I misunderstood it, I could explain now how I understand it and how I would uh, advise others to deal with it. And I think a lot of these things are quite common. It changes with generation. In our generation, it was uh, not uncommon for a devotee to join ISKCON and their parents wouldn't even know where they were for like three years. Uh, one devotee didn't call his parents for 10 years. That was like, you know, a very, very renounced, right? 
like Sukadev Goswami, he had no attachment to his parents. It wasn't renunciation, it was just a lack of empathy for his parents, basically. Yeah. So then you get confused. No, it's renunciation. He's just distributing books. Yeah, that's part of it, but it's also denying his human nature. Right? Yeah. So any of you want to write the paper on this? Mm. I'll read it again. This is what the topic of your paper. Being a good spiritual practitioner, using being used to using covering up and defending ourselves from our feelings of not being good enough in our spiritual practices. I'll read the whole paper. Forget, forget that. Erase that. Being a good spiritual practitioner can be used to cover up and defend ourselves from our feelings of not being good enough, resulting in our spiritual practices being used to defend against or deny our real life human issues, which prevents us from being a healthy and balanced human being. So that's your dissertation, Tanya, or whoever wants to write a dissertation. Actually, all, all we really need, all we really need is like one or two pages, just like written for people joining ISKCON saying this is the, these are potential ways of thinking. And then now some of you are thinking, oh my God, my whole temple thinks like that. Yeah, that's possible. So that's why we need the paper. And then you'll give it to your temple and they'll go, this is rubbish, and they'll throw it out. You know? Anyway, when they're 50 or 60, they'll understand this. Sometimes you can't understand these things till you're older. Okay, so. For example, a devotee can engage in practicing Krishna consciousness for decades, which can greatly enhance their lives, yet seek out psychological help because they remain wounded and not fully developed on the emotional relationship or personal level, and may be acting out in their wounding in harmful ways. It is not unusual for a person to speak about the eternal bliss of our true nature, whoops, of our true nature as eternal souls, but then, but then struggle to trust that when their psychological... It is not unusual for a person to speak about the eternal bliss of our true nature as eternal souls, but then struggle to trust that when their psychological wounds are triggered. That's not written. But then struggle to trust when their psychological wounds are triggered. Yeah, you know, if you get triggered by some, um, I was in a meeting a few months ago and I said something and two devotees went like crazy when I said it. And I was thinking, oh, I just triggered them. It was like a, they, had, they had like something in their lives, something, something um, that was really upsetting that I triggered. You know, I mean, I didn't. I didn't feel like, oh, I was stupid to say that, or I said something wrong. I just felt like, oh, I triggered something. I, I, I knew what I said wasn't wrong, per se. So if you ever say something or do something that you know, per se, isn't wrong, and it really upsets somebody, is because you hit a trigger. And, um, you know, most people don't know that, but at least you can know that. So you don't take, you know, you don't feel like, well, I did something really bad. No, you just hit a trigger. Some devotees have told me they know the triggers of their gurus, so they don't hit those triggers. They say, yeah, this is a trigger from, if I say this, he'll just get upset. I don't say it. <laughs> they learn by experience, you know. So, you know, we're all human. What to do? Um, okay. Okay, it's time for questions. So I'll go to the chat and see what's going on there. Do we have anything left over from last week? No, from yesterday. From what's today, Monday? Gopinath, this means that even if you are in a spiritual process, you still have to go to therapy. Um, it depends on the person. I would say, if you're in a spiritual process, you can always improve yourself. You can always 
enhance your psychology. You can learn to be better. I don't want to say everybody needs, not everybody needs therapy. Therapy is usually um, if you have some deeper wounds or you're finding, you know, something in your life really is difficult. It may need further investigation. The word therapy is it's, it's sometimes misunderstood. You know, if you, I'm going to therapy. Oh, what? You're crazy? You, you know, what's wrong with you? You know, therapy can just mean, you know, just, you know, redirecting you or just creating a clear understanding about a problem and how to deal with it. It can be very simple. So Sydney says, yes, makes so much sense. But what makes sense? We don't know. Something I said. You have to say what I said before you say it makes sense. Okay, I'm going to share the article. What I will, I will, Tanya, send me a WhatsApp and remind me to share the article, and then you can make it available. This is from Krishna Karshani. You said that a devotee husband is very KC because it's very strict and is upset because his wife is not strict. To be honest, I have doubts. This husband is really KC. If he would, he would be understanding. Yeah, well, that was the point I made. That was facetious. This husband thinks he's KC and his wife isn't, and he's just shaming her all the time and getting angry. At, he gets angry at her because she's not Krishna conscious. Okay, on the scale of one to 10, how Krishna conscious is that? To get angry. I'm so Krishna conscious that you can't live with me unless you're Krishna conscious. How Krishna conscious is that? Yeah, the understanding supportive, exactly. Yeah, he's fanatic and immature, right? And he's driven his wife completely crazy. Looking in a mirror is sometimes not so fun. You really start seeing yourself. Yeah, but anyway, it's fun if you can work on yourself. Sydney, you are what you are. Can't change that. You can only make it better. So look in the mirror. That's the beginning of making it better. From Krishna Karshani. For what you're saying, it seems that KC or immature vision of KC, some devotees, is an obstacle, but should be the opposite. Yeah, that's what the that's what the dissertation has to be on. Like this, this looks like Krishna consciousness from outside. But if you look at the ramifications of what that devotee is doing, the results are not Krishna conscious. So that's um, you know. It's a way of evaluating something. Okay, this is Krishna conscious. On paper, it looks Krishna conscious. What's the result of it? Well, the result of it is everybody left my temple. Oh, well, how Krishna conscious was that? Well, I just told them they were nonsense. It's right there in the Bhagavad Gita. You know, they're doing this, they're nonsense. So they all left. Well, how Krishna conscious is that? That's so you may do something that's Krishna, that looks Krishna conscious, but if the results are not Krishna conscious, then you have to go back and think. I guess that wasn't Krishna conscious. I just thought it was. Right? Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? You can't judge just by the action. Like I've often said, oh, a good teacher teaches everything perfectly. How was the class? I taught it perfectly. Doesn't mean you're a good teacher. Did the students learn anything? No, they didn't get anything, but I taught it perfectly. Oh, you're a useless teacher. No, but I taught it perfectly. How can you say you taught it perfectly if nobody nobody understood it? But I did teach, I taught it exactly. Right. And so it's like that. No, I did Krishna consciousness. I am Krishna conscious. I, and my I'm divorced four times. Uh, what kind of Krishna consciousness is that? <clears throat> from Nirmala. When you explained about Maya relating with marriage, I'm just curious. We were born alone, right? But in between, we are too much into Maya, very much attached. Into it later, when we get old, it seems we were here to play a role to support God's creation. How can we overcome from Maya? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. Sadhana Bhakti, that's how and being smart, reading Prabhupada's books, being smart, having good sadhana. Otherwise, we're never going to overcome the desire to imitate Krishna unless we take to the process that will purify us of that desire. How can one recognize real detachment from unreal detachment or suppressed feelings? Like in the example where the devotees didn't call his parents for many years. 
Um, well, if you're exhibiting attachment that is not typical, excuse me, if you're exhibiting detachment that would not be typical of someone on your level of Krishna consciousness, then you know this is it's artificial. I'm not that detached. Uh, um, one of our disciples uh, lost her mother unexpectedly last week, and she was saying, you know, I, I read in Bhagavad Gita that we're not the body, that one shouldn't lament for the dead, and I thought I understood that until she left. I've, um, I've seen this with many devotees in many situations where they thought they were detached until the object that they thought they were detached from was gone, and they realized how attached they were. So, Generally speaking, you can't be more detached than your level of spiritual advancement. So if you're on this level and you're assuming your level of detachment is up here, you're probably wrong. And so just be careful. Not always. I'm not saying always. I'm just saying be careful. <clears throat> the tendency will, could be to think, you know, if you, if you get good association, if you have strict sadhana, you will be detached but it's detached that day and you'll that keeps you detached but your actual level of detachment will be lower right so so what i'm saying is you um you all know that when your krishna consciousness is strong you feel strong and when it's weak you feel weak so when your Krishna consciousness is strong, you feel strong, does it mean you're strong? It means because you have the influence of Krishna consciousness, you're strong, but you're still weak. Until you're on the level of bhava or close to it, you're still weak. And we always see that weakness. So we, we just need to, you know, understand that, you know, if I'm feeling very detached and renounced, it might be spontaneously inspired in the moment. Like you hear a class and it's like amazing class. You're really inspired. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give up this and give up that. And then you try to do that. And two days later, you're like sick in bed because you didn't get enough sleep. Have you ever had that experience? It's because you, you know you're inspired, but you're not on that level. So yeah. So it's sometimes discouraging, but it's real. So how will you know you're actually that detached? The answer is you probably probably aren't that detached. <laughs> Just start there and examine it from there first. Okay. Um. Allowing myself, from Bart, allowing myself to be hurt by someone calling me a fool. Once I actually responded to that, you don't have any right to do that. I will not take verbally, and he also realized that he said it unintentionally and asked forgiveness. So what kind of nature is that? Is he even being trying to take control over his words? Well, I can't say. You'll have to answer that question, but at least you, I think you protected yourself. Of course, you could have said, I know I'm a fool, but you don't have to tell me. <laughs> hmm. What kind of nature is that? Chatria, you call me a fool, step outside. We'll settle it. <laughs> but I think it was good in the sense, maybe, maybe how you did it wasn't good, but what you did was good. You. You're not going to allow people to demean you. Now, if what you did was foolish, then that would be bad. Then you have to live up to it. Krishna Karshani says, what to do if our actions or words triggered someone and this person becomes upset? No, run away? No, apologize. Whenever you say something which you think is innocent and it upsets somebody, then you understand you triggered something. It's, just, it's the black and blue mark that you just touch. Oh, oh, that's what it is. 
it's a sensitivity and everybody has a sensitivity in some area. So as you say something, you know, if I, you know, if you have an issue, let's say if Tanya has an issue with something, and I say something, oh, Tanya, you could do it better this way. And that directly addresses, addresses an issue that she has, like I always do everything wrong, let's say, that could really upset her. When she starts crying or something or whatever, runs out of the room, I'm like, I just told her that's better to do it this way. Simple thing. I tell everybody that. And so we would we would tend to want to blame her, but that's not that's not the best way to deal with it. We should understand that there's some issue in her life that has just been triggered. And we should take note of that, that this person's sensitive to that. You know, and you know, I could say I didn't say anything wrong, and she's just getting upset for no reason. Well, people don't get upset for no reason. It's just that I, you know, what I did was not wrong. Okay, but but she got upset. So I have to, you know, face that and deal with it. Recognize it at least. Then, okay, she got upset. She has an issue. Um, I'm dealing with uh, another situation where a husband triggers a wife, but he doesn't know why he's triggering her, triggering her. But you know, you know, if you're a good husband or a good wife, you have to know the triggers. And you just have to stay away from the triggers of your partner. Because you say the wrong thing, they'll get really upset. And, and you'll be thinking, well, I say this to everybody, nobody gets upset. It doesn't make it right. But, but this person gets upset. It's just, it's not that you said something wrong, but to this person, it was the wrong thing. That's the point. Okay, you didn't say anything wrong. It was just wrong to say it to them. Detach for a moment. I've been having that experience for the past five or six years. You'll, yeah, until you get to Baba, it'll probably be that way. Or at least to Ruchi. I've been triggered a lot lately, but I'm choosing to view them as positive. They're allowing me to analyze the why behind the trigger, painful but necessary and therefore positive. Very good. Five gold stars to Sydney for that one. Okay, I think that's it. I can... Um, we have 15 minutes, so if there's nothing else, I'll continue reading. No other questions or comments. Okay. Hmm. 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 You know what's what's really powerful? When you um when you find it difficult to do something and you start to think, well, my life is meant for the service of others. And if I solve this problem, I will be better in the service of others. So let me, so let me face it so I can be better. And my spiritual master wants me to solve this problem. Srila Prabhupada wants me to solve this problem. So let me do it for them. Because it's always easier to do something for somebody else than it is for yourself. I had this dream last night, I think it was last night, and I don't know the context, but in the dream, there was this idea, there was something, someone was asking me, why are you doing something, or I was doing something I didn't want to, and I kept saying, because Prabhupada asked me to do it. So, that's a strong impetus. This will please, this will please my husband, this will please my wife, this will please my friends, this will please my Siksha Guru, my Guru. This will please Prabhupada. That's a strong impetus. Of course, the perennial question. Well, what if it pleases my Siksha Guru, but doesn't please my Diksha Guru? Oh, okay. That's for another class. At least it pleases somebody. All right, let me talk to your diction girl. Well, uh, okay, so we're going to read some more. So, talking about psychological wounds. This may show 
as our developing compassion for others, but being hard on ourselves for not living up to our spiritual ideals, resulting in our spiritual practice becoming dry and unsatisfying. Rendering service to others turns into a duty or a way of trying to feel good about ourselves, or unconsciously we use our spiritual brilliance to feed our narcissistic inf inflation and devalue others or treat them in manipulative ways. This is really, this is really dangerous. You know, if you have a if you have a narcissistic nature, which is the nature to kind of blame everybody for everything or to put people down and never face up to your own stuff, you could use Krishna consciousness quite well for that, because you know, just go to our books and you can see all the things that are wrong with everybody. And you won't think about yourself as having any of those problems. You'll just see everybody else. And so you'll use that to shame and put down other people. Have you seen that before? Yeah, so that's dangerous. You know, like if you have that tendency then you could use the philosophy of Krishna consciousness to strengthen a dysfunctional tendency. That's pretty scary. That should go in the dissertation also, how you're using, you take a dysfunction and then that dysfunction is triggered by our philosophy. And then that dysfunction actually becomes more dysfunctional as a consequence of philosophy. That's really dangerous, isn't it? That's why we need that paper so people can see these things. Of course, the problem is that the people who do that, when they read the paper, won't understand the paper at all, or they'll think it's just garbage, you know, why they probably, Prabhupada never, this is the, you know, you, you tell somebody it's exactly what they need to hear, and they'll say, Prabhupada never said that, you know. What can you do? Every time I go somewhere to do a seminar, they always say, oh, there's so many people that need to hear the seminar, then I get there and they go, none of those people came. <laughs> I go, of course, they never come. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Okay. Shastric evidence, yeah. Ram Baru Prabhu can give you the Shastric evidence. So you're gonna write the paper, Tanya? You're the most qualified. What do you think? She's going to try. You're going to try? Start it? Gabriella can help you. Gabriella, this is a paper we want to write that was like warning signs on the road of spiritual life, how, how the spiritual process can feed into psychological dysfunction, um, suppression of, of um, feelings, emotions, and so forth. So as a guideline, as a warning to people who become. We gave it to Tanya to write, because she has a degree in psychology. But if she needs help, she can you can consult her. And this whole class was kind of a class about leading towards that kind of discussion. Mm. Wow, people with depressive tendencies who may, who may have grown up with a lacking of loving attunement in childhood can have a hard time valuing themselves. And when they cannot perfectly live up to idealized faith and practices, their shame and guilt over this becomes their main focus in spiritual life. That's pretty heavy, their main focus. Did you pick up on that? The guilt and shame is their main focus. They live in guilt and shame with the fact that they can't live up to the highest spiritual ideals because it's, they, they have such a low opinion of themselves that the spiritual process even makes it lower. And sometimes they think, well, I'm just becoming humble when actually they're just becoming more shameful and guilty and weaker. Have you seen that before? That's why I made the joke, next to every Hare Krishna temple, you need a mental hospital. Because if we don't, if we don't teach these things properly, then some people will become worse psychologically. Yeah. There was a devotee. He was 
super intelligent, like super, like top, top in his own. You know, in school, he was top in everything, top athlete, top student, top everything. And then he was starting to do that in Krishna consciousness. And he came to a point where we had some spiritual trouble. And he left Krishna consciousness because he couldn't be tops. He couldn't be number one. And, and he's never experienced that in his life, not being number one. That was interesting, huh? Sadhu Sangha, devotee association, often becomes a place where people play out their unresolved family issues by projecting onto gurus and religious leaders, seeing them as parental figures, and then trying to win their love or else rebelling against them wow. when they don't get the love. Sibling rival rivalry and competition with other Sangha members over who is their teacher's favorite is all too common. So this is... Um, this was not written by a devotee. This was written by a Buddhist who experienced this in the Sangha that, you know, you know, the guru seemed to show more favor to one disciple over another, and then some disciple feels dejected. I didn't get the favor. Have you seen that before? Yeah. It's understandable, but it, it comes from, let me read it again, because it, it's explained what it comes from. Spiritual practices are also often used to avoid uncomfortable feelings and unresolved life situations. No, 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 no. no. Sado Sangha often becomes a place where people play out their unresolved family issues by projecting onto gurus and religious leaders, seeing them as parental figures and then trying to win their love or else rebelling against them. Sibling rivalry, yeah. They don't get their love, sometimes they leave. That's less, that happens less often. Mm. The guru always loves the disciple. Sibling rivalry and competition with other Sangha members over who is their teacher's favorite is also common. Yeah, so I've even had this experience that uh, I, I had a Siksha disciple who had a, a very, very difficult upbringing. And um, if I were with a group of devotees and she didn't get the most attention, she would get very angry. So that's an example. But then eventually she left me. So it's exactly what's being said here. Okay, we have some more chat. Oh, Krishna, this article is opening up all I see in myself. You're not the only one, but yes, it is. Yeah, I love this article. It's, you know, we're on page three. There's 17 pages. So we're going to be with this for a while. Yeah, I really, really appreciated this article. I don't know where I got it. It's Spiritual practices are also often used to avoid uncomfortable feelings and unresolved life situations, which can reinforce a tendency towards coldness, disengagement, and interpersonal distance. This then makes it impossible for them to relate directly with their feelings and express them personally and in a transparent way. It can be quite threatening to face our woundedness or emotional dependency or primal need for love. You know, we talked about this also. It's part of the problem is everybody, you know, wants to be seen as Krishna conscious. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want others to think we're weak, which is a weakness. Did you know that? Not wanting others. I don't want you to think I'm weak. And the fact that I don't want you to think I'm weak is my weakness. <laughs> so what to do? Okay. So I think we can end here. So um, anybody want to say anything further? This later um, says, why the ego is a small chatria, a small God, probably for me, it is a great lake to cross. Um, because it's, um, any of these questions, why is this such a problem? Why is it so big? It's because it's, 
it's programmed into the material psyche because that's what you need to enjoy the material world. So like all the things you need to enjoy the material world are all obstacles to bhakti. And so when you ask, why are they so strong? It's because they've been developed for millions of lifetimes. Because those are the things you need to make the effort to enjoy the material world. Controller, enjoyer, right? Number one, succeed, get ahead. That's, that's what you do. That's what you have to do, so-called, to enjoy the world. At least in passion and ignorance, that's what you do. So that's why it's hard. Because it's you, pro so you have to reprogram it now. Those programs don't work when you're a devotee. So Gabriella says, one of the most common family issues that come to psychotherapy is the experience of having a disabling and critical father figure that is not resolved. It generates a series of problems in interpersonal ties throughout the person's life. Yeah. You know. Yeah. If you desperately are looking for acceptance from others or spiritual figures, it can be problematic for you because maybe you'll never get enough of it. Like what would what would be a sign that you've got the acceptance? Or maybe that person can't accept you the way you are. That's also, you know, then what do you do? Right? So that's, you know. But like I said, Prabhupada accepted us. So maybe someone doesn't accept you, but Prabhupada does. So that you can always, you know, you can always remember that. Prabhupada accepts you. Okay, so why don't we end now? Who's in charge of the... I will end it now. So we're going to end now, and then we'll begin our japa, if you want to.